Rogers TV. My dear Will, I see by this morning's news that Sarah Remember me to mother and the little ones. Kiss them all for me. Wishing you a On Saturday, Christmas. I got leave and paid a visit. I am sending two pair of socks now and some prints. And I hope to God you came through it all right, for it must have been an awful time. And if you got oh, dear old mother, take good care of yourself and don't worry. We all feel One of my little buddies, Davy Carew, was killed by a sniper. He Dear Willie, I'm going to Beaver Pond with my pop and Mary Garland and mother tomorrow. I'm going to get my As far as the eye could see, nothing but dead and dying. And you could see the wounded crawling from the shelter. When war was declared in 1914, September 2nd, my mind was made up, and I went to the CLB Armory, where Dr. Wakefield gave me a medical examination and enlisted me, number 466. Knowing that I had fallen arches in my feet, I was careful to brace them up by pointing my toes in. The government had asked for only 500 volunteers. We were camped at Pleasantville and were given khaki drill uniforms and blue puttees. The latter were used by the Church Lads Brigade, of which they had a stock on hand. For the next month, it was quite a picnic. There were mothers coming down to headquarters saying that their sons who had joined up were underage. So it was quite a mix-up and remained so until we reached the other side. 
I came to St. John's, went to the CLB Armory and enlisted. I was accepted. I lied about my age. There was 500 of us, marched down, led by the CLB band. My mother heard about it and immediately wired my father and said, go and get that boy. He's not old enough to go overseas. But when father arrived in town, the ship had already sailed. I was gone. In memory, I can still see the crowd on the wharf. Women trying to get a last handshake and goodbye kiss from their sons, and sweethearts waving goodbye. And the fathers and brothers cheering the departing ones and trying to keep up a brave front. So good old C Company set sail, and we went off on the great adventure. The hardest was over, and now we had the war and its great trials ahead of us. It's good that we could not see what fate had in store for us, as the words of one old verse comes to me. We went away, boys, and came back scornful men who had dice with death under the blazing skies. If anyone took you Dear Father, I received your letter two days ago, but could not find time to answer it before. I let two fellows have it out the other night. One got a black eye and the other a broken conch. They were arrested the next morning, and so was I for not reporting it. One of them got 16 days confined to cells, and the other 14 days. I was brought up before the old major and given a severe reprimand and lost my promotion to full corporal. But hell, what do I care? I'm not over here for stripes. I'm on a bloody good time at present. If I'm sent to the front, I shall go. But while I'm in Edinburgh or any other city, to hell with the stripes. Tell mother everything is okay with me. I must close now. Give my regards to all. Sincerely, your son, Will. We are all very particular here that we not be classed as Canadians, for apart from the fact that we are much prouder of our distinction as Newfoundlanders, the Canadians, generally, have been getting a bad name for themselves wherever they have gone, and this applies particularly to London. We are hard at work every day, chiefly bayonet practice, while they have Hessian sacks filled with straw hung about four feet from the ground. We kill them with a vicious lunge, you bet it gives us an idea of what real war is. I hope you won't think us bloodthirsty, but we often regret it's not Germans who are there instead of sex. Wouldn't the boys just paste them? Thank you. 
On our arrival at the Dardanelles, we were landed in big barges and were under fire right away. We were marched up from the beach to a gully or ravine for shelter. Then we were at war. And we began to realize it too. We landed on September 20th and received our first baptism of fire. The Turkish batteries began shelling the beaches and 15 of our men were wounded. As we were marching along, a shell burst near me and a piece of it was rolling along by us. When one of our boys, Mike Welch of St. John's, put out his foot to stop it and took the best part of his foot off. The war was over as far as he was concerned. On the 22nd, our first fatal casualty occurred when Private Hugh McWhirter was killed. I went on watch in the trenches with Lieutenant Taylor of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. We both went to a new trench we were building. We came in and about four o'clock, Taylor went out again, saying I need not bother coming. He had not gone five minutes when he was shot and died before five o'clock, being buried shortly afterwards. It was only a matter of luck that I was not with him. Jack Fitzgerald was one of the bravest in the whole war. The morning the others were shot, he took his Red Cross satchel and went out in the midst of the hail of bullets and began to bandage wounds. One bullet struck him and he staggered for a moment, then went on with his work of binding the wounds of his comrade. But shortly after he fell, and when we brought his body in, there were five bullets in him. He gave his life for others. One of my little buddies Davy Carew was killed by a sniper. He forgot and stood up to straighten his back and lost his life by doing so. He was just 18, and only the night before, he asked me if he could share his blanket with me as he felt lonely. I suppose being older than him, he thought he was okay when he was with me. I missed him a lot. Next day, his two brothers and I buried him under a big oak tree. Bob Morris and I were cookhouse orderlies, getting the cookhouse stuff ready with the three other chaps. We were having our last meal sitting around the fire just outside the dugouts, which were mostly built of sandbags. A shell struck the dugout just above ours and landed right in the center of the fire. Bob had just said to me that he heard we were going back to England to refit for France. While we were talking, I heard a shell coming and ducked into the dugout. Sergeant Garland was sitting outside, and the percussion before the shell burst overbalanced him. He turned a somersault, and as he was falling, he received a wound in the back. The shell killed Bob Morris and wounded two of the other chaps. Bob was the last Newfoundlander to be buried on the Dardanelles, and I helped with the stretcher that took him to the grave that was already dug. I was detailed to form a burying party. We brought Bob to a great pit that was dug there and laid him in it, said a few prayers and covered him. I guess there were hundreds in that one huge grave. On March 22nd, we reached Marseille and boarded a train at 9.30 p.m. Just after our arrival at Leuvencourt, I was told to report to the battalion headquarters. That is when I discovered that I was to be Batman, 
a battalion runner. Leuvencourt was a quiet section where the wheat was planted and ground tilled. It was not too far away from the front line, which was the valley of the Somme. We were to discover soon that it would lose its quietness. My dear mother, we had an awfully quiet time indeed in the trenches. Only one real casualty in the battalion, a man in my company who, looking at an aeroplane, shoved his head over the parapet about 20 yards from the Huns. He was sniped dead on the spot. Your loving son, Bernard. Our lot have had a few casualties since coming to France, but on the whole have been certainly in luck's way. The day before yesterday we lost Sergeant Manning of A Company. Poor Manning was a very quiet fellow and liked by his men. They all feel his loss very keenly. My dear Will, I see by this morning's news that Sergeant Manning was killed in action. There is nothing but trouble. Every day brings its own. Lance Irving and the fellow Kearney left to spend the time at Mars, and nothing have been heard of them since. Today, Tuesday, they're left by train two cars of volunteers to search for them. Of course, you knew Lance, and the fellow Kearney is the fellow who just came from the front. He was wounded in the head. We are having lovely weather now, just like August. I don't know how long it will last. Goodbye, my darling boy, until I write again, which will be very soon. They all want me to write a letter for them, but I am very short of ink. It is very thick in the bottle. I will write for them soon. I remain your loving mother. Fred wants me to tell you we got four little chickens. My dear mother, the Germans that are coming in don't look like much. You can count all the good ones amongst them. They are either middle-aged or quite young boys and all seem glad they were spared to be taken prisoners. The big majority are a poor, depraved-looking lot. Your loving son, Andrew. My dear Will, there was a letter came home by boat from a South Side boy to say he was cold and hungry and dirty. I hope you will not feel like that. We had a great game of cards last night. May was over. There was 10 of us playing. It was at 11 o'clock before we knew where we were. I must close now by wishing you good luck and best wishes from your loving mother. I only want to tell you about the rats. They are in swarms and big monsters. I never thought rats could grow so big. And there we find them roaming about the dugouts, looking for our rations. My dear Will, I sent a parcel the first whole holiday in the winter containing socks and chocolates. I see by the paper also complaints that the men at the front lack comforts, short of socks. You won't be that, because I will keep you supplied from now on. I am sending some Prince Albert tobacco. They use it here now for making cigarettes, so I am sending some little papers with it. I must now close by wishing you good luck until I write again. With best love from all, I remain your loving mother.
prior to July 1st, two raiding parties had been out to the German barbed wire and cut gaps, which later proved to be not very effective. They did not capture any German prisoners, which showed that the Germans were all ready and just waiting for the attack. The Hun certainly appears to be expecting our visit, for they are, according to reports all along the front, hard at work. There seems to be a strange pensiveness about everything, and we were all strangely thoughtful about the great push. The other day, some of us visited Gus Manning's grave. I am sure his friends will be glad to know that he is not forgotten by his comrades. I think his grave is by far the best amongst that lot of heroes who have died for king and country. I will ring off for this time, but will write again shortly, when I hope to send you a very interesting letter. Tell everybody that they may feel proud of the Newfoundland Regiment, for we get nothing but praise from the Division General down. At 9 a.m., we had a battalion parade for the purpose of being addressed by General Delisle. He spoke for about 10 minutes. He said he was glad to have the honor of addressing us as a battalion for the first time, on the eve of what is going to be the greatest battle in the history of the world. He impressed upon us the danger we would have to encounter, but that he had no doubt that we, who had the sole honor of representing Newfoundland, would bring honor and credit to ourselves and Newfoundland, judging by what was said and known of us in the past. I had a suspicion we were going into battle. In fact, we had church service that Sunday prior to that. Being a Catholic, I went to confession. On the 29th and 30th, we knew we were in for it. So we all wrote letters home and left messages with our chums if we should be killed. Some of them were sure they were going to be killed. And I knew a couple of chaps who thought that way and were killed. My dear mother, we are having fair weather, but it rains every other day for some time. I am quite well. We've been having quite a time of it a few weeks back, but everything points to big things soon. They tell me the mail is to be stopped after the 30th. Now, dear old mother, take good care of yourself and don't worry. We all feel that we will see you in time for the harvest. There will be a big to-do before I write again, and I will tell you all about it. Nothing else to tell. We go in tonight for six days. Your loving son, Andrew. Just one more last note before moving off. Jim and I are in the best of health and spirits, and I trust we may remain so. This will be my last letter for a short while. We left 9 p.m. to march about nine miles up to the trenches. Our mail had just arrived as we were leaving. Eric Eyre, who walked with me ahead of the column, said it was just as well to read our mail as it may be the last before going into battle tomorrow. During the long night before the battle, I spent these hours in the company of four close friends from the town of Grand Falls. I remember we joked with each other, but it was forced hilarity as we knew we were going out into no man's land and beyond. These four buddies were killed in that drive. I would look out across toward and past the German line and scan the landscape beyond the rising ground from sunken Beaumont Hamel. Everything was so quiet, your thoughts would be taken away from war. The landscape was the same every day. You would think, surely, this is not war. We were supposed to leave our trenches at 7.30 a.m., but the time was postponed. 
We were told the reason for the delay was that the brigadier and Colonel Haddo weren't able to get a clear picture of the situation. I believe that they knew the Germans were ready and waiting. An officer of the 87th Brigade jumped down in the trench and went to the battalion headquarters. Seeing the look on his face, a feeling of misgiving went through me. I immediately asked the question as commander of the regiment, what was the situation in the enemy front line since the initial attack at 7.30 that morning? I received the reply that the situation was not cleared up. Then I asked if I was to wait for the Essex on our right or attack independently. I was told to attack independently. From the very start, it was obvious that the enemy were not only extremely well prepared for an attack, but were actually expecting it. I immediately sent for my company commanders and explained to them the serious situation now existing. I then gave them sufficient time to get back to their companies and issue orders. The adjutant came out with two messages. I delivered the message to Captain Bruce Reed of B Company and Captain Eric Eyre of D Company. That was the last message they received because a few minutes later, they stepped up on the parapet when Haddo came out and waved his hand. At 9.15 a.m. on July the 1st, I gave the signal to advance over the top. On my giving the signal by whistle, the leading line rose as one man and we started off. A whistle sounded and the men climbed up from the trenches single file. Each soldier was burdened down with heavy equipment, consisting of mills bombs, shovels, pickaxes, ammunition, regulation kit, water bottles, and even ladders. Schütze Schindler saw den Feind von seiner Stellung aus dem Graben steigen. From his position, marksman Schindler noticed the enemy rising from the trench and sounded the alarm. The machine gun immediately went into position and opened fire on the enemy. The result was very effective. I just got outside the trench. The fellow was badly hit. I got out my water bottle to give him some water. When I was doing that, the machine gunner spotted us, apparently, and I was hit in the hip. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, being married, I was picked among the 10% who were kept back. We were vexed because we weren't picked out to go over the top. But after a couple of minutes looking at it, we began to think how lucky we were. We started off too far back. They didn't see the front line of the Germans. We were told to advance from where we were. It was the back line, down a slope, a nice steady slope against the skyline. Everybody was seen all the way. There were two big cuts in our wire, and the Germans must have had every gun trained on them. As the men marched off towards these gaps in the barbed wire in single file, they were picked off by the German machine gun fire and artillery. The gaps filled with dead bodies. The enemy had just passed in his own wire at the hollow and proceeded in dense groups. This enemy was placed under fire first with very good results. 89 died out of one gap in the barbed wire and 82 out of the other. It was an awful sight for us survivors to see. Our good friends and buddies for years piled up like that. Those who did get through were mowed down in no man's land. There was no British fire protection either. The impression given the men was that this push would be a quick walkover with no opposition. The Newfoundlanders were held up at the German barbed wire and were sitting ducks for the German fire. 
We waded off through an overwhelming hail of machine gun bullets, accompanied by shrapnel. I rushed on with Captain Eyre, and glancing around, saw but a few men scattered about, but still going ahead. Turning again, I saw Captain Eric fall, and rushing up to him, saw his wound was fatal. But in the shadow of death, with the wave of his cane, he urged his men forward. Lieutenant Wilfred Eyre led my platoon and instructed me to keep about the middle in case we both should be knocked down together. And if he fell, I was to come up and take his place, which I did when I saw him drop about halfway across no man's land. Lieutenant Eyre was, I believe, shot through the heart as he dropped so suddenly. He was lying face downwards when I passed him. I led my platoon toward a gap in the wire. I knew nothing before I was shot in the shoulder, the bullet entering just above the lung and through the back. I was sitting down when my sergeant rushed over to see if he could do anything. I told him I could make it on my own. Of course, he didn't survive. We went like lines for the Germans, the bullets flying like drops of rain, and we fell like flies. We went till the last man fell. As far as the eye could see, nothing but dead and dying. And you could see the wounded crawling for the shell holes. I got the bullet through my knee before I got halfway over and I got tangled up in the barbed wire. I don't know how I got clear without getting another hit. I crawled into a shell hole. I got up out of the trench. The boys were falling on either side until there were only two of us left. He got it. He was killed. Then I got it. I got two bullets in me. I dropped. Blood was coming out of me. I thought they saw me go down. I stopped the blood as best I could. The sun was pouring down and they were shelling. The Germans were. I caught up with Lieutenant Ferguson of the next platoon, who asked me where the rest of my men were. I told him that these were all I had left. We then carried on through the German barbed wire and fixed bayonets. We threw two bombs into the German trenches where I saw them land. A grenade landed in front of the machine gun after 280 rounds, buried the gun and wounded the marksman. The gun was quickly reassembled and put back into position. The machine gun was able to fire again as the enemy appeared on the other side of the hollow. We were then about 20 yards from their trenches, but were unable to get nearer, as all of us, about 10 in number, were then and there shot down. That was the nearest our regiment got to the German lines. I was knocked over myself with shrapnel, which struck me in the head after breaking through my steel helmet. The enemy fell into confusion under the well-aimed fire, hesitated, partly threw themselves to the ground, and were completely cut down. Any opponent who tried to withdraw or showed himself in some other way was picked off by Eichler. The shell fire died down a bit, and the wounded began to straggle in. Boy, that was an awful sight. The front line was like a butcher shop in hell, with our wounded dragging themselves in and falling down in the trench. I could see no one moving, but heaps of khaki slumped on the ground. Rally saw a man crawling into our trench on the left, and he said to me, Stacy, go along the trench and see what you can find out from him. I started to push my way through the trench. The trench was filled with the wounded, and as I tried to push by, agonizing cries would come from them. It was too much for me, so I turned and went back and told Rally it was impossible. When the CO and I got down to the front line, I remember one old man flopping in, an old seaman from northern Newfoundland, flopped down into the far step of the trench, was badly hit. He didn't live, but he just said to me, is the old man pleased? That's all he wanted to know, all he thought of. 
whether he'd done his stuff. I found the trench blocked with dead and wounded when I got there. There was not a man seen standing of the attacking force. At 9.45 a.m., it was all over. When I came to in no man's land, I stayed where I was because every now and again some of our boys would try to make a run back to our trenches, but no sooner than they would move, a hail of bullets would bring them down. Each man was issued with a tin star which he was to put on his back. The idea for this was that the British could trace the progress of the men by the sun glinting on these stars. Of course it backfired as they could be seen by the Germans and were clear targets. All day long we were watching through glasses and any of our chaps moved from where they were lying, the Germans would shoot them. The big piece of tin on their backs that was meant to spare life cost the lives of many of our chaps that day. Sunday came. I lived throughout Sunday, but when the sun went down, I gave up. I said my prayers, and I seen my mom as far as I knew, but I knew she wasn't there. They picked me up, and I don't know who. I don't know how I got to a hospital where they operated and took the metal out of me. I laid where I was in the hot sun all day without moving about until 10 o'clock in the night. I managed to get back to our trenches, messed up a bit from the wound in my head. They said I had a blighty, meaning I would have to go to England. I was then taken to a stretcher to where I was given injections and later moved to Leuvencourt. There you stand on concrete round, the one we know so well, now withered, worn, erect, with dead arms reaching to the sky. Some say you died when they did on the 1st of July. It's quite lonesome here now. All my chums are gone. I suppose it'll be my turn next. I don't much care. I'm satisfied to die for my king and country. It'll be quite a shock when they hear the news about all the poor fellows being killed. Dear Mother, I cannot tell you anything about the hospital here, as we must keep absolutely quiet on these matters in France. This is a very wicked world, Mother. You cannot realize what sufferings there are. Some of the misery will ever live in my memory. After the 1st of July, about the 6th, I think, we left for a rest, and what a march that was. All our chums gone. We were just dragging along the road when Sergeant Major Hicks bought a couple of accordions and put one in the front and one in the rear and they started up the banks of Newfoundland, and we cheered right up. When we were relieved, Lieutenant Owen Steele and Major Forbes Robertson were walking down the center of the village road when they heard a shell coming in their direction. Robertson ducked into the ditch on the right-hand side of the road and Steele made for the other side under an old barn. Fate was against Steele as the shell exploded where he ducked in the barn. Friday we heard that Steele had died of wounds. 
When we rested for five days, we went in and took over our old lines again, and our first job was to finish burying our dead. Some job it was to take these black and swollen bodies, taking the equipment off them. When the equipment belt was open, what a gush of air out of the swollen bodies. Then we had to take their pay books, letters, watches, etc., mark them and turn them in so that they could be sent to their relatives. We just dug a hole alongside the body and rolled them in with a little simple prayer. It's a grand thing that mothers could not see the way that their sons died. Dear Mrs. Eyre, two parcels have arrived for burn from you since I last wrote. The contents were divided up. His kit will be sent off to the usual channels and letters will be sent back. I gave his fountain pen which he had on him to the Sergeant Major. It is very much appreciated. Please excuse this inadequate letter. Yours affectionately, John F. Evans. My dear Willie, tomorrow is a whole holiday, and I think Pop, Mother, and May Garland, and a few of the youngsters are going to Beaver Pond, if it's fine. I see by the casualty list that Charlie Strong is wounded. They had extra prayers for him last Sunday. Freddie wants me to write him a letter to you. So I must close with lots of love from your loving sister, Audrey. Dear Willie, I'm going to Beaver Pond with my pop and Mary Garland and mother tomorrow. I'm going to get my picture taken in my new sailor suit and send it to you. I haven't got any more to tell you, so goodbye from little Fred. My dear Willie, I am writing you these few lines to let you know that I got your letter of the 18th of June in due time, and we were very glad to hear you were in good health when you wrote. But I see by the papers that you fought a big battle since then, and I hope to God you came through it all right, for it must have been an awful time. And if you got through it, you must be one of the very lucky ones. I only hope you did. And if you did, we must thank God for it, if I can judge from the number of killed and wounded on the casualties list that have come in. They number up to now 500 and are still coming in. But you are not amongst the number that have come in so far. And I hope and pray to God that you won't be on it. I must close now with love from your loving grandpa, Warren. And may God bless you, my son, and watch over you, Grandpa. The Caribou just like the one in Barring Park. It stands majestic on the stones, head raised to the sky, mouth opened. It heralds the dawning of each new day, watches over the once muddied trenches, now manicured grass, patches of clover. When dusk comes and all is silent, it joins the others in the field who have drifted there to talk 
of days gone by. I know them for good men once, when men were needed. And after all, I will ring off for this time, but tell everybody that they may feel proud of the Newfoundland Regiment. For we get nothing However, one has to make the best of it. The one thing that makes life endurable is looking forward to one's leave. How is Jim and I are in the best of health and spirits, and I trust we may remain so. This will be my last letter. I saw Captain Eric fall, and rushing up to him, saw his wound was fatal. But in the shadow of death, with the wave of his cane. Remember me to mother and the little ones. I remain your loving son, Will. Newfoundland Regiment's first objective on November 20th was a lock crossing over the St. Quentin Canal, west of the town of Menier. Much of the battlefield, which included the infamous Hindenburg Line over which they advanced, had already been taken earlier that morning. The Newfoundlanders encountered some resistance along the way, which they neutralized with their accustomed dash. The approach to the first objective was heavily defended by enemy machine guns and snipers who had taken up positions in houses near the lock on both sides of the canal. The approach provided little cover and the regiment began taking heavy casualties. Under protection of fire from a lone tank, the regiment was able to advance and capture the lock crossing. They encountered more opposition once they were across and heavy fighting took place to clear abandoned gun pits west of the town of Manier. That evening, the regiment formed a defensive line facing the village. Mop-up parties were sent into Manier to clear the houses of the enemy. They soon discovered that in the enemy's hasty retreat, they had left behind more than 400 refugees, mostly women, children, and the elderly. On the morning of the 21st, the Newfoundland Regiment was ordered to move east of Manier to prepare for a brigade advance towards the village of Rumiyi. Before reaching their intended positions, an errant high-explosive shell landed in the middle of a column of soldiers, killing seven, including the regiment's famous sniper, Lance Corporal John Shewak, and one of the heroes of Manchi Le Pru, Sergeant Walter Pitcher.
On November 30th, the enemy counterattacked with such fierceness they easily swept over ground previously captured by the British 10 days earlier. Pandemonium reigned as stormtroopers advanced towards Marquois, nearly pinching off a salient that was occupied by the 29th Division. With no hesitation, the Newfoundland Regiment lowered bayonets and charged the enemy stormtroopers east of Marquois, leading other regiments in an aggressive attack that stemmed the enemy advance. The day's fighting ended with the regiment manning a trench facing south, in complete reversal of direction from the first day of battle. The regiment was instrumental in preventing the enemy from surrounding the 29th Division. Early on the morning of December 3rd, the enemy launched a ferocious artillery strike on the Newfoundland lines using trench mortars and field guns. The pounding fire continued until noon, leveling nearly all the trenches in a narrow sector south of the canal. Waves of German infantry broke through the line after killing and capturing many Newfoundlanders who had barely escaped the shelling. Concentrated machine gun and rifle fire from another part of the Newfoundland line halted the enemy advance. The Newfoundland Regiment's valiant role and sacrifice at the Battle of Cambrai would finally come to an end when they were relieved later that evening.
This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. If you have a comment about this program, we'd love to hear it. Email or call us or send us your feedback through social media. Come share in the joy and laughter with Spirit of Newfoundland as they celebrate 25 wonderful years. Join your favorite spirit performers as they toast a quarter century of fun, food, and fantastic music. For ticket information and upcoming events, check out spiritofnewfoundland.com or phone 579-3023. Clubs, leagues, and courts.